When you think of motorbike drag racing, your mind has images of wild hogs, nitro Harleys, and guys like this amusing dude who I met in remote far north Queensland one time. But look at the people around him. The funny thing is, unlike a lot of other motorsport, drag racing is a really family-oriented activity for both spectators and racers. So if you have a few minutes, today I'd really like to introduce you to a friend of mine. He's not an in-your-face kind of guy, but he is seven times Australian champion in the wildest and most brutal category of them all. Hey Chris, here we are again. It's the start of a new season. Yes, new yes. season, yes. New, new series, Sydney, here we are. Yeah, and as usual, we've got a bit of wet weather. And yeah, yeah. You come all the way from Queensland in your massive transporter that could take five supercars in it, yeah. and you've got one motorcycle in one, it. One lonely little bike. It'll What's be alright. Does the bike have a name by now? Uh, depends what it does. If it's well behaved, it has a name. If it's not well behaved, it has a number of names. <laughs> it's just the bike. You know, a lot of stuff I've had before in the years, you got a bit emotional with it and had names for NASCARs and land speed stuff and bikes. But I always think of it as a big cobra snake curled up in a spring waiting to bite someone and the closest person to it is me. Yeah. So I tend not to get too close to it because it can get nasty. Yeah. So I give it a lot of distance and a lot of respect. Not enough respect that you keep away from it, you still get on it. Still get on it, but I try and limit my time. You know, the less time on it, the, probably the better. In, in one sense, you need really, in a perfect world, you should be on it every three weeks, you know, for a couple of days to stay in the groove, but the way COVID and the way the seasons have been, you know, we're lucky to be on it once every three months. The last time I was on it, I actually had an accident um, and smashed my leg up. So that was probably three months ago, but not long before that, before the Winter Nationals last year, you know, we went nearly two years without being on it because of COVID. So the excitement's still there when you get on it then? Oh yeah, yeah, well, when I get on it at the line and the, the guys start it while I'm lying on it, you know, all the pain that you have sitting here talking to you, I'm in a lot of pain from age and injuries over the years. When I go up there and they start it, you're 18, you're 18 again. You've got no pain. You're only thinking about what's about to happen and what your job is and um, yeah it's there's not that's euphoric those six seconds it, it's a pretty unusual club you're in there's not a lot of people get get to do it and it's it's not something you can easily teach people to do either no it's if i asked you to teach me to do it what, what would you say what what would be the requirements i'd need both as, as a not just physical but as a person before you got on one of these I think probably the biggest thing is you'd, you'd have to be 100% committed to it and it's not just the six seconds or five seconds or whatever it is when you actually ride, it's the whole process of away from the track and that's probably the biggest commitment. You know, I still do, for the last 10, 11, 12 years, I'm still doing three days a week in the workshop, um, you know, trying to improve things make things better, try and make it safer, try and get long jeopardy in the, the parts we use. Uh, and then it, then it goes to a whole different level. You come today, last night, driving down here in the truck by yourself, thinking about what you, you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So there's sort of two parts of it. One is the big commitment time-wise to get it right. And, and financially, you know, it's, a, it's not cheap. <coughs> very difficult to get very good people around you and then they they sort of drift away when it comes to you're on the bike you're on your own so there's no one there to help you they start you and get you going and it's the baton is handed over so right oh Chris you go and do your job That's what you've got to do. So it's, I think it's a not a lot of people have the commitment and I guess the passion mm. to do those things. Okay, 
So I couldn't come in as a contracted rider, for example, where you do all the work and say, OK, the bike's ready, and I arrive in the helicopter, rock up to the track, and away you go. You could, but I don't think you'll be... Your long jeopardy will be there. Yeah. You know, you could get on... You might have one good pass. Yeah. As soon as it's anything slightly out of the ordinary, I'd be dead, basically. Well, you could hurt yourself or someone else. Yeah. Um, yeah, plenty of guys fly in. Larry Dixon behind us here in a fuel car, flies in for the States, jumps in and he'll, you know, he'll run the numbers. Um, but it's a different deal. You know, you're in a cage. Well, even the guys in the fuel cars, when I've talked to them about top bike, they just, they just shake their head and look at their feet and go, there's, there's yeah. no power on earth would make me get on one of those things. No, well, often I think the same thing. <laughs> you know, if you have a, a wild ride, you know, and survive it, you, you come back and you think, yeah, wow, you know. <laughs> and here you are 10 years later, it's, it's more than 10 years since I first met you, probably 13 or 14 now. Yeah. And uh, I saw your first rides here and you... Yep. You fell off here at Sydney. Yep. And one of your first rides here in the left lane took a big tumble. Yeah, yeah. And the, the crew came over and they thought they saw your helmet lying on the ground and the third yeah. off shooting's heads come off. Yeah. Yeah, well that that night we we had an oil line come loose. It sprayed all the oil out of the bottom of the motor all over the bike and put me into the wall. So uh, eventually I got it off the wall and by the time I got the brakes on I'd run out of track and yep. crashed and, the and gravel and yeah anyway yeah. if we went through your chronicle of all the stacks you've had <laughs> this would be, be a very a long, 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 long video long. Yeah. you've electrocuted yourself yeah yeah but just to come back to one notable I suppose it's a lucky you're kind of shaped like a bowling ball yeah. in a way or less so now I reckon you've, you've lost a bit of weight but yeah that, that helps if you fall off on a, on a racetrack at 300 and 80, 89 yeah 389 k's an hour yeah yeah. Off the bike. Yeah. We'd been up all night fixing a motor, which is the beginning of the end, because yeah. tyres, these things, because they move so fast, there's your reactions behind everything. So you've pretty much got to do the run before you go in your head, then you've got to preempt what it's going to do. That particular day, I didn't go through my routine in my head, and on the track down here, at that time, there was a bump in the right lane at the finish line. So I always used to go over the bump, then reach out and put my brakes on. This particular day, we'd already top qualified. We'd already set a new track record. I didn't think logically like I normally do because I was tired. That led to a mistake. I reached out to grab the brake before I'd gone over the bump, hit the bump and the brake lever tapped my fingers and lifted my fingers up and tore me off the bike. And in that long head-on view that's shot from almost 800 metres away, almost a kilometre away, it's so elongated lens, you can't quite get an appreciation of just how fast that was. Yeah. That you fell off the bike at 380 k's an hour. So yeah. I just ask people to imagine what it's like jumping out of your car on the freeway at 100 k's an hour. And I was actually on the side of the track there and the view from the side of the track is quite different from the view on TV. You're a freaking Exocet missile coming yeah, past. it's moving. I saw some footage that you did very early in the piece. You were on the right-hand wall at about three or 400 feet. And when I saw it, it scared me because you were so close. You know, the first 60 feet, it does 100 mile an hour. In 60 feet? In 60 100 feet. miles an hour. Yep. So, you know, 160 kilometres the first 60. Half track, which is 200 metres, um, it's doing 210 mile an hour. From there on to the finish, it's doing a football field in distance a second. So you can't be, oh yeah, I'm going to go over here, I'm going to go over there. Your um, front wheel's a metre in the air. Um, you've got all your steering through your feet, so you're trying to put weight on yep. the foot pegs to try and manoeuvre it. And it's like trying to herd three-legged cats. It yep. just doesn't, doesn't do what it's told. Yeah, 
it's a handful. And then if you have a good run doing that, a whole different world appears because you've somehow got to pull it up in the short distance that we have. Um, and that is, often that's becomes the hard a problem. Part in Australia. Yeah, yeah, our runoff's short. So, yeah. But it's very satisfying when you get to the end and you get off it and you look at what you've been working on, it's still all together, you've survived and you've run a good number. It's very satisfying.